Today's story is going to be physically uncomfortable to listen to. And at the end of the story, I'm going to show you a video that is highly distressing. So viewer discretion is advised. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please encourage the like button to join the official Mr. Ball and Discord server, but secretly manipulate their account so that no matter how engaged they are on the server, they can't level up. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. At 4 a.m. on February 25th, 2022, a 36-year-old father of three named Christopher Boudram woke up inside of his modest home in pointe a pierre which is a city on the Caribbean island of Trinidad and Tobago. After quietly getting out of his bed so as not to wake up his wife, who was still asleep, Christopher walked into the other room and did his typical morning exercise routine, and then afterward, he made himself some breakfast in the kitchen, and by 5.30 a.m., he was out his front door in to his car, making the commute to work. Christopher was a professional scuba diver, and he had been for over 10 years. Commercial diving is a very broad field to work in, but generally it meant that Christopher was paid to do various tasks underwater, things like inspections or welding, or just moving equipment around. For the last eight months, Christopher had been fortunate enough to be working for a company that was located just two minutes drive from his house. It was an oil and gas company called Perea Fuel. And Christopher's duties at Perea Fuel centered primarily on the upkeep and maintenance of several of these underwater pipelines that Perea Fuel used to get the oil off of their ships and onto land where it could be processed. These underwater pipelines, of which Perea had at least six, were basically U-shaped. They had these two vertical sections on either end that would jut out of the water. And then connecting these two vertical sections was a 1,200 foot long section of pipe that ran along the seabed at roughly 60 feet below the surface. And so one of these vertical sections was out at sea, so 1,200 feet off the coast, and ships would literally come by this opening to the pipe that was out of the water, and they would dump their oil into this opening. The oil would go down, it would shoot across this long horizontal section, and then go up the other vertical section much closer to shore where workers could collect the oil and bring it onto land to be processed. So on this particular day in February of 2022, when Christopher arrived at Perea Fuel, he was not surprised at all to find out that he and his diving colleagues would be doing some maintenance on one of these underwater pipelines. However, there was something unique about the particular pipeline they'd be working on. It was called Birth Number 6, and unlike the rest of Perea Fuel's underwater oil transport pipelines, this one had not been active since 2018. So for the past four years, it had just sat idle. Now, this was on purpose. For whatever reason, the company had decided not to use Birth Number 6, and so they put it into a sort of storage mode, where the vertical section of Birth Number 6 that was out at sea was untouched. It was still just poking out of the water, no changes. However, the other vertical section of birth number six that was closest to shore was first plugged up, like imagine putting a cork inside of a wine bottle. That's basically what they did to this vertical section, except they used this huge inflatable cork. Imagine like a huge pool toy. They basically jammed it inside of the vertical section and then they inflated it so much that it was completely airtight inside of this pipe. And then once it was all plugged up, they submerged this section of the vertical pipe underwater, maybe five or ten feet below the surface, to kind of keep it out of the way of all the ships that would be moving around close to shore. And then also what they did is they put something called a habitat on top of the opening of this now submerged vertical section of birth number six. To understand it, you got to picture something else, okay? So imagine you're in the bathtub and you have a bucket and you flip it upside down above the surface so there's nothing inside of the bucket and you just take the bucket and push it straight down into the water. 
No matter how deep you push that bucket, as long as you don't rotate it to one side or the other and you just keep it steady, that air pocket inside of the bucket will remain. You can literally reach your hand under the bucket underwater and it will be dry. And so basically that's what this habitat was. Perea Fuel took a huge bucket, if you will, and they lowered it straight into the water and pressed it down and anchored it right above the opening to this submerged vertical section. So there was a permanent air pocket over the opening to this pipe. And the reason for this is because if they needed to do work on this pipe, like for example, today they wanted Christopher and his colleagues to make this pipe active again, which meant doing work on it, the divers could swim down, get inside of this habitat, stand on the little metal platform they put in there, and then they could take off all of their cumbersome diving equipment and just work on the pipe while breathing air. It was really kind of a luxury. And so after Christopher and the four other divers he be with that day got their instructions you know to get birth number six active again they began getting all their gear together and going over who would be responsible for what once they got down to the habitat and then once they were all ready they made their way out to the boat the four other divers that christopher would be working with that day were men he had worked with many times before and men he would consider his friends their names were kazim ali jr yusuf henry faisal kurban and rishi nagasar once their boat had moved just off the coast and had stopped kind of roughly over the area where below the surface was this submerged birth number six vertical pipe and the habitat, the divers hopped off the boat and they swam straight down. They went up and under the side of this habitat wall and they entered into this breathable airspace right around the entrance to this pipe. And so they climbed up onto the platform, they took off all of their gear, and then once they were just in their wetsuits, they got to work. Now, the job was relatively straightforward. They just needed to basically pull a lever inside of the pipe that would then deflate the big inflatable plug that had been set inside of this pipe to seal it. However, when one of the divers reached down and began to pull on the lever, it was jammed. And so they needed a wrench to kind of free the lever. And so Kazim volunteered to go back to the surface and get a wrench because no one had one inside of the habitat. And so Kazim put his dive gear back on. He dove out from underneath this habitat, swam back to the surface. He talked to the folks on the boat. They handed him a wrench and then he swam right back down, back inside of the habitat. And then once he poked himself back up, he handed the wrench up to the the nearest diver. And that diver took the wrench, he turned back around to face the pipe, he reached down inside and he began fiddling with the lever and eventually he freed it. However, the second this lever was activated, something horrific happened inside of that space. This is not a normal ad. I am not trying to get you to buy anything. Instead, I want you, all you fans of the Strange, Dark, and Mysterious, to join our Discord server. It's completely free, really. Totally free. And if you don't know what Discord is, don't worry. I learned about it like two months ago. It's a totally free to download app that allows communities to get together in one centralized place. And ours is awesome. Once you click on the Discord invite link in the description below, you'll be brought through a very simple onboarding process. And then boom, you're in. And if you have any issues along the way getting set up, we have incredible moderators and people in the community that are ready to help you. And then once you're all set up, just start participating. There's there's so much to do in there. There's all these different forums and voice chats. There's live digital campfire storytelling that members are self-organizing. I'm seriously on there all the time, happy to chat with you. And the more you engage with the server, the faster you level up. You come in at level one with certain privileges and the top level is level 100. And along the way, each level offers real life rewards that are specifically tailored to fans of the strange, dark and mysterious and I can promise you some of the upper level rewards are pretty good. Also, we will be using Discord as the place we go to drop announcements, whatever it is, whether it's a new event or a new product or anything to do with our universe, we're going to Discord first. And we have a lot
lot of huge things planned over the next couple of years. And so it really benefits you to be in the know. And again, all you got to do is join the server. So if you're a fan of the Strange, Dark, and Mysterious, click the Discord invite link below in the description or click on any of the Discord invite links in my social media bios and join up and then start participating and work your way towards level 100. But don't wait because literally thousands of people are doing this and we will always be able to tell who signed up early. It literally gets attached to your username and we will likely begin rewarding people that joined the server early. So again, click the Discord invite link in the description below. Okay, back to the story. We don't know exactly how this happened or what exactly could have been done to prevent it, but in short, the second that lever was activated, it began to deflate this big cork that had been plugging up this inactive pipeline for the past four years. And when that happened, it broke the seal and suddenly all this low pressure air that was sitting in 1200 feet of pipeline made contact with the extremely high pressure air that was inside of this habitat and air likes to go from high pressure to low pressure. And so the second that seal was broken, the high pressure air in the habitat expanded down into the pipe. But this happened so, so quickly. It was almost instantaneous. It was almost like the pipe opening became the world's strongest vacuum and it sucked everything inside of the habitat, all the air, all the equipment, all five men into the pipe. And it also began sucking in seawater. Basically everything was going in the pipe. And so these five men, they don't have their scuba gear on, went from just standing outside the pipe to feet first flying into this pipe with all of their heavy equipment all around them and their seawater all over them. They're holding their breath. And so they get sucked down the vertical section. They turn the corner and they get rocketed out to sea. They're on the 1200 foot long section, the horizontal section, just blazing a trail. Now think about this. All five of these guys have no idea what's happened. They're on a breath hold. They are shooting down a pipe. They can't see anything. The space inside of this pipe is so narrow. It's two and a half feet across. And so they're getting compressed. Their shoulders can barely fit inside of this pipe. And so you got to figure that all of them are expecting to die. But eventually the pressure in this pipe did equalize, at which point this vacuum phenomenon stopped up at the habitat. And actually the habitat kind of refilled with air. And when that happened, all the seawater that was getting pulled into this pipe also stopped. So no more air, no more seawater is going into this pipe. It's kind of like whatever went into the pipe, that's what's down there. And when this equalization happened, these men, who by this point are on a several minute long breath hold, they eventually begin to slow down and come to a stop. And by some miracle, they came to stop in a section of this horizontal pipe that was not totally flat to the seabed. It was slightly elevated, which meant there was a small air pocket where they stopped. And so they come to a stop and they just start gasping for air and then they begin yelling out to each other and they realize all five of them are alive and they're all kind of roughly grouped together in this air pocket. And we know this because one of their cameras on their bodies was rolling when they were pulled into the pipe. And so we can't see anything because it's pitch black inside of this pipe, but we can hear them talking to each other once everything stops. And so over the course of this kind of chaotic initial volley of communication up and down the pipe, where again, these guys are on their backs, you know, they can't move at all. They're completely kind of trapped in position. And even though they're in an air pocket, there is water kind of close to their face. And so they have this little area to breathe in. They're panicking, they're screaming at each other. But in this volley, they're able to figure out that Christopher was the closest to the way they had come into the pipe, meaning his head was closest to the vertical section closest to shore, and all four other men were right below him. And so Christopher knew if they were going to get out, their best chance was to backtrack, head towards the way they came in, which meant Christopher would have to lead them. And so Christopher kind of found it within himself. Again, we can hear him on audio. And he told the others to calm down and link their 
feet onto the person below them's shoulders. And so to do that, the only way these guys could move in this tight little pipe is just by pushing with their heels. And so painfully, slowly, these guys who are very badly battered at this point, I mean, they came flying in here surrounded by all their heavy equipment crashing into them. Guys had broken bones. They were really badly beat up, but they finally make their way until they're all linked, you know, feet under each other's shoulders. And then Christopher in the lead began kind of going in reverse, inching their way up the pipe back towards the way they came in. Now, the reason they felt strongly that they needed to act right away and not wait for rescue is because because they didn't really understand how this had even happened. They didn't know if at any moment more water was gonna pour into this pipe. They also understood that there was limited air and at some point they would suffocate. And so with that in mind, they begin this journey. And right away, Christopher reaches the first flooded section of the pipe. Now, you have to understand, they have no idea how long this flooded section of pipe is. And so once you start moving into this flooded section, behind you, once you go underwater, you're either going to find another air pocket at some point, or you're going to drown. And so it would turn out that only Christopher and the guy right below him, Faisal, were willing and physically able to attempt this potential suicide mission. And so the others, they began panicking. The others who were not going to go, and they're screaming out for Christopher and Faisal not to leave them. You can hear it on audio. But Christopher and Faisal, they felt strongly that somebody has to go to the surface and get help. And so Christopher and Faisal linked together, begin inching into this flooded section of pipe, pitch black. They have no idea what's gonna happen. They're slowly going under the water and they just begin inching their way on a breath hold. And by some miracle, this first flooded section they entered into was not very long. And so both Christopher and Faisal were able to barely, you know, coughing and gagging, get out the other side into yet another air pocket. And by an even bigger miracle, in that new air pocket, Christopher above him, he managed to get one hand above his head, he felt scuba tanks, two of them. And he was able to take one of them and somehow force it past the side of his body down to Faisal. And so both men suddenly had an air tank. Now they had to kind of awkwardly pin the tank above their head. These tanks are not light. If you've not scuba dived, it's like pushing a pretty heavy weight. And they had the regulator, so the mouthpiece that actually gives you the air in their mouths, but they couldn't really hold the mouthpiece in place. It was this very awkward thing they were going to do, but this meant they could now enter much longer flooded sections of pipe and potentially make it out the other side. And so with their air tanks on top of their heads and their mouthpieces in their mouth, gripping down as hard as they can with their teeth, they continued to inch along with their heels and they entered into more and more of these flooded sections of pipe. As they're doing this, they know they have a scuba tank, but they have no idea how much air is in these tanks. They can't see the gauge. And so it's kind of the same thing as going in on a breath hold. You don't know when you're gonna run out of air because you don't know how long these flooded sections are. So you can only imagine how terrifying this must have been. But they kept on going and going and finally, after hours of this, that Christopher and Faisal are going through these terrifying stretches of, you know, hoping they can hold on to that mouthpiece and hoping they got enough air. They'd get through these flooded sections, hit the next air pocket. You know, after hours of doing that, they reach this air pocket where Faisal starts to kind of lose it. And he starts yelling to Christopher in the total dark to stop, but he didn't have a reason. You know, and Christopher could kind of sense that, you know, Faisal is starting to lose it and we're running out of time here. And Christopher, I mean, he can hear the other divers that they had left behind in the beginning screaming out all the way back down the pipe. And so Christopher, he stayed composed and he tried to get Faisal to calm down and come with him. But when it was clear he wasn't going to, he told Faisal that, hey, I'm gonna keep going alone then, I'm gonna get us help and I'll be back for you. And so Faisal, he was still panicking and he yelled at Christopher not to go any further, but Christopher knew he had to go. And so with the sound of his friends screaming out for him to stop, Christopher again cinched down with his teeth on the mouthpiece, continued to push this air tank above his head, and he inched his way closer and closer to the entrance of this pipe. And after reaching a very long underwater section where he knows he's running out of air, his tank hit the kink in the pipe where it went vertical again, which meant right above him was the exit. The habitat is right up there. And 
so Christopher was able to kind of turn and swim up this vertical section until he popped up. And it was again another air pocket, except the water level in this vertical section was not close enough to the exit of the pipe to actually pull himself out. It was like Christopher was stuck at the bottom of a well, like there's nothing he can do. But luckily there was a chain that was dangling down in arm's reach. And so Christopher grabbed the chain and just had to wait, having no idea if anybody was coming to get them. But eventually two rescue divers did get into the habitat and they reached down and they pulled Christopher out of the pipe and they saved him. And when they brought him up to the surface, Christopher saw that Perea Fuel had their emergency response team on site, the Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard was there, and it's clear they're getting ready to do some sort of rescue operation. And so Christopher, who's totally traumatized, he's badly hurt, he still ran up to authorities and told them, all four of my colleagues are still alive. I heard them banging in the pipes. I know they're in air pockets. You gotta go back down. You gotta save them. But ultimately, the authorities decided it was not safe to send rescuers down into this pipe. And so when Christopher found out they were not gonna try to rescue his friends who are literally banging the pipe, he can hear them, he tried to jump back in the water to do it himself. And they stopped him, and then Christopher was rushed to the hospital where once he was admitted to the intensive care unit, he tried to check himself out to go back to the water to save his friends. But again, Christopher was stopped. For two whole days after Christopher was rescued from this pipe, his colleagues, the four other divers, remained trapped in the most claustrophobic, horrible situation imaginable, and they continued to bang on the pipe and make noises that could be heard on the surface, but nobody did anything. And so finally, on February 27th, the noises stopped inside of the pipe because all of the men died. They either died of suffocation because they ran out of air in the pipe, or they died from one of their injuries, or they attempted to do one of those long underwater sections of pipe on a breath hold because they didn't have scuba tanks, and they drowned. On February 28th, three of the divers' bodies were recovered, and the final body, the fourth diver, was recovered on March 3rd. It's unclear why Christopher and the other divers did not do something to equalize the pressure inside of the habitat and inside of this pipe before undoing the plug, because this vacuum effect, which is known as delta P, is actually easy to anticipate and relatively easy to prevent. But the investigation into exactly what happened and and who is to blame is still ongoing. However, the only survivor, Christopher, and many other people who are following this case, they believe the four deaths are directly attributable to Perea Fuel, who were primarily responsible for not allowing a rescue operation to happen in those first two days where you could clearly hear the sounds of these divers banging on the pipe. And so to finish this story, I'm gonna show you the final footage taken by one of the divers, Kazim, who was the one who got the wrench and brought it back inside the habitat handed it off, and then that wrench was used to push the lever, which created the vacuum. You'll see in this video that it looks like nothing is going on, and Kazim is just inside of this habitat, and all the divers are fine, and then it's like his camera just turns black. What's happening there is he was pulled so quickly into the pipe that it looks like it was a cut of the camera when in reality, that's just how fast everything inside of that habitat was pulled into the pipe. This video is highly distressing. Viewer discretion is advised.
So that's gonna do it. If you got something out of today's video and you haven't done this already, please encourage the like button to join the official Mr. Ballin Discord server. However, secretly manipulate their account so that no matter how engaged they are on the server, they can't level up. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. We have a podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast that puts out brand new exclusive stories on Monday mornings, and on Thursday mornings, we put out the remastered audio of our best YouTube videos. Again, the podcast is called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, and it's available exclusively on Amazon Music. Consider donating to our charity. It's called the Mr. Ballin Foundation, and it provides support to victims of violent crime as well as their families. Monthly donors to the Mr. Ballin Foundation Honor Them Society will receive free gifts and exclusive invites to special live events. Go to mrballin.foundation and click on Get Involved to join the Honor Them Society today. We have two additional YouTube channels, Mr. Ballin Shorts and Mr. Ballin and Espanol. We put out near daily content on TikTok, Facebook, and Snapchat. All of those channels are just called Mr. Ballin. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. To check out our merch, to join our Discord server, or just see what's going on in the strange, dark, and mysterious community, be sure to check out our brand new website, ballinstudios.com. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, Facebook, other YouTube channels, the podcast, wherever, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.